In this video, we are going to briefly talk about protists and fungi. First, let's talk about the protists. Protists are going to be eukaryotic organisms that are not plant, they're not animal, and they're not fungi. When scientists were first coming up with this kingdom, they placed all eukaryotic organisms that weren't plant, animal, or fungi in this particular kingdom. So as you can imagine, there's going to be a variety, a very wide variety of organisms found in this kingdom. Some of them are going to be plant-like. An example of that are algae. They're able to go through photosynthesis. Some are going to have animal-like characteristics, such as the protozoans, which are microscopic, animal-looking, and some of them are parasitic. Some are going to be fungi-like, such as slime mold. So I want you to keep in mind that slime mold is not the same thing as, for example, the food mold that you find in your, your refrigerator or on your um, household items or things like that. Um, slime mold is actually a type of protist. All organisms in this particular kingdom are eukaryotic. They're going to come in a variety of sizes and they acquire nutrients in different ways. For example, the algae are going to be photosynthetic. Most protozoans have to eat something. They cannot produce food on their own. And some of them are parasitic. And then you have things such as slime mold that are going to move along forest floors and decompose things. Protists are mostly involved with asexual reproduction by mitosis, and this is when the genetic material um, gets copied, makes the cell makes identical copies of itself, and then it divides into two different cells, but with identical genetic information. Some of them do go through sexual phases. Protists are important for us to study because number one, some of them cause human diseases, for example, malaria is caused by a protist called Plasmodium protozoa. They are also important because they are major producers of oxygen on our planet. For example, algae and diatoms contribute to oxygen production on Earth. Some of them are going to be used in our products. For example, diatoms are photosynthetic, but they are also used in toothpaste and sometimes in things such as laundry detergent. If you get laundry detergent that is eco-friendly, decomposable, they use, oftentimes they use products that come from diatoms. Some of them form symbiotic relationships. For example, coral reef formation in the oceans. Um, this is going to be many organisms that are going to be working together as one unit and they provide an ecology and a food web for marine life. In your lab manual, there is a little bit of um, discussion over unit conta versus biconta, so I'm going to talk about that briefly. First of all, unit conta and biconta, these are believed to be ancestral um, cells, and they are eukaryotic. So biconts are were these eukaryotic organisms that had two or more flagella. Again, that's why we have the term biconta. At the anterior end of the cell, it is believed that many organisms, such as plants, um, probably came from biconts. Unicons are were these cells that had a, one flagellum, if they had any, and the flagellum was located at the posterior end of the cell. Unicons are believed to be ancestors to species, including fungi, animals, and some related forms. So again, when we look at the evolutionary tree, these two eukaryotic cells are believed to be ancestors to some of the major organisms that we see on Earth today. Now, we did talk about protists. We did include protists as one kingdom. However, today many biologists no longer believe that the protist kingdom or the kingdom protista is a valid kingdom. 
And the reason for that is that it is believed that all multicellular complicated forms on Earth evolved from protists. So we can't really put them in one category because they are also different from each other. So many biologists no longer like to use kingdoms. They like to use something else, a different way of categorizing organisms called supergroups. So instead of using kingdoms, in this lecture, we're gonna use something else, a different way of organizing evolution and organisms called supergroups. So remember, we still have the three domains, bacteria, archaea, and then eukarya. And then eukarya is going to branch out into five different supergroups. So these are your supergroups. We don't, it's hard to tell which actually came first or not. I believe there's some estimates, but as you go back in the evolutionary tree, it gets harder and harder to know things for sure, especially if there isn't much of fossil records. But it is believed that um, there was somewhere along the way a common eukaryotic ancestor. And then from that, you're going to have these different um, super groups. If you do a Google search on this, you will see that some textbooks have six super groups now, but in your lab manual, there is five super groups. So we are going to stick to the five super groups. Again, I want to uh, mention that all of these five super groups contain organisms that are eukaryotic. So we have the plantae supergroup. This includes plants, of course, but some algae. Um, then we have chromalveolates, the unicons, rhizaria, and excavate. And what's interesting about these five supergroups is that you will find protists in all of these five supergroups. And that's why it's not such a good idea to put all protists in the same category. The first supergroup is the Unicanta, and this is the supergroup where you're going to find fungi, you're going to find animals, a very wide variety of organisms, and you're going to find some protists here. In your lecture, you might start talking about some subgroups and groups within these supergroups, and we're not going to talk about them so much here in lab, but we want to talk briefly about what each supergroup is, what kind of organisms you find in each supergroup. So um, Uniconta is going to include some protists, such as the amoebozoans, and that will include slime molds. Again, slime molds are not fungi. And, uh, and another group of organisms called antenebas. And these are mostly free-living organisms, and some of them are going to be parasitic, such as histolytica, which causes human intestinal disease. I believe it is this one over here. So this is a slime mold, and this is histolytica. Next supergroup is Rhizaria. A key feature for this supergroup is that the organisms are going to have pseudopods. And this is a false foot. Pseudo is false and pod is foot. So they're going to have these extensions here, as you can see, that kind of look like feet, and it helps them with movement and locomotion. There's going to be three groups within this supergroup, um, Radiolara, Foraminephra, and Cercozoa. We're not going to talk about the details, but I do have Foraminephra here as an example. These are more marine organisms with carbonate shells. The shells are going to have chambers. And then as these organisms grow, um, they add onto their chambers. And they're not diatoms, by the way, but they look a little bit similar to diatoms. Next, we have um, chrome, av excuse me, chrome alveolates. This is a super group. And this is going to include many organisms that are going to be found in in the sea. However, um, they don't, there is no common morphological trait. You're going to find that each subgroup has unique features. And there's going to be two major subgroups here, the alveolata and stramenopyla. The alveolata, as you could see over here, it's going to be a group of organisms that are going to have these membrane-bound 
um, sacs called alveoli just under the plasma membrane. And we could, if we look at it under a microscope, you see these alveoli over here. An example of the straminopyla or diatoms, as you can see right here, they're all going to look different, very geometric. Um, they're major producers of oxygen for our planet. And of course, um, the shell, the outer shell is used for many products. And this, out, this outer shell is actually made out of two pieces. That's why it's called diatom. And one is actually very slightly bigger than the other. So they kind of fit together like a shoebox. Other examples of Straminopyla are the golden algae, the yellow-green algae, and the brown algae. Next supergroup is plantae. Of course, this includes plants. However, some protists are going to be also found in the supergroup, including red algae, green algae, and um, algae can be multicellular, have multicellular characteristics or they could be unicellular. Um, so glaucophytes, as you can see here, this is going to be a unicellular algae, but you could also see these multicellular ones here. Next we have the excavates. Um, these organisms were grouped together based on their cytoskeleton. What you'll see when you look at their cytoskeleton is that they have a groove on one side, so it looks like it's been excavated. What's interesting about the supergroup is that many organisms that fall under the supergroup have modified mitochondria that does not go through the process of um, oxidative phosphorylation. So it means that there's no electron transport chain which is quite interesting because this is how we, our cells get most of their energy. So excavates use a lot of anaerobic pathways to receive energy. An example is Giardia, um, Lamblia. It has two nuclei over here, as you can see, and this is a parasite, um, an intestinal parasite that can be contracted if you drink untreated water. Sometimes hikers get this because they drink water that has not been treated. Now for lab, you are going to look at these organisms based on your lab manual. Um, these are going to be organisms that you're going to be looking at under the microscope, and you're going to be drawing them under 10x and under 4dx magnification, and you need to draw them in as much detail as possible. Hopefully you remember how to use a microscope. If you don't, um, please ask for help. And these drawings will need to be included in your lab report. So draw them in as much detail as possible. Um, you might want to bring color pencils if you have them, bring them to lab. If you have a tablet or an iPad, you, use, you prefer to use that for drawing, you could bring it to lab and draw these. So organisms that you are supposed to be looking at are Euglena, which consists of over 900 species. These are quite interesting because they're photosynthetic, but they all, they're also able to um, feed on organic matter, and in some cases, they even digest other organisms. So once you draw these, you want to do a little bit of research on Euglena, find out which supergroup it belongs to, um, how it acquires nutrients, how does it move. It actually can move in several different ways. So find out a little bit more about it and include that information in your lab report. And of course, use um, reliable sources to get this information. Next organism you want to look at is the paramecium. Again, do a little bit of research on this and draw it in as much detail as possible. And you're going to look at dinoflagellates as well under 10x and under 40x. So the organisms that are going to be given to you, you're going to make wet mounts with them and you want to draw them under 10x and under 40x if you want to get full credit for your lab report. Now let's talk about fungi. So this is a whole other kingdom. So protists technically were one kingdom and then fungi are going to be another kingdom that we're going to talk about briefly. Fungi are also eukaryotic organisms 
and they're going to be a very wide variety of organisms. They are not plants, and this is a common misconception. And the reason for that is because they cannot go through the process of photosynthesis like plants can. So even though you find them in the produce section of your grocery store, um, they're still not considered to be plants. They will include mushrooms, mold, and yeast. According, according to your book, 144,000 known species. Currently, I believe there's more than half a million that have been identified and fungi have had many uses for humans for example penicillin the discovery of penicillin um, making bread beer cheese and this this has all been possible to us because of fungi and some of them are parasitic but actually not too many of them are parasitic around 100 species are considered parasitic and oftentimes when they infect humans, it is usually opportunistic. So it means that the patient has already been immunocompromised and therefore now has been infected with some sort of fungi. And fungi are gonna be the major recyclers of our planet because they break down dead or dying tissue. Again, fungi are not plants, do not perform photosynthesis, and you could find them in many different environments. They are heterotrophic, which means that they cannot produce their own food. Um, they do have to get their food from other sources. They are or eukaryotic organisms, so they're going to have a nucleus. They're going to contain organelles, and most of them are multicellular. Now, in the cell wall of most fungi, you find something called chitin, and um, I do want to talk about what the term mycology means. Mycology is the study of fungal kingdom. And in biology, anytime you hear the word myco, it implies some sort of fungi. Most fungi are saprobes, which means that they live on dead or decaying matter. They decompose things. Some of them form symbiotic relationships with other organisms in nature. So, for example, plant roots and mycelium of mushrooms. You could think about mycelium sort of as the roots of the mushrooms, but we shouldn't use the term roots. It's just called mycelium. But they do form symbi symbiotic relationship. And some of them, of course, are parasitic. Now, based on what I've seen in your lab manual, you do need to understand fungal morphology. So the fruiting body is the part that you see when you go to the grocery store. So when you go, you, when you go to the grocery store and you see the mushroom, you're looking at the, fruit, the fruiting body of the fungus. Or whenever you're going out into nature, go for a walk and you see some mushrooms, that is the fruiting body. That is a small portion of the actual fungus because underneath the fruiting body, there's going to be a network. So under the soil, there's going to be this network that's going to be supporting and nourishing the body. The fungus is going to be made out of lots of thin filaments called hyphae. And sometimes it's called mycelium filaments. Now, when you put these collective network of hyphae together, it is called the mycelium. And of course, the mycelium allows for nutrient acquisition, for growth of the fungus, and for production of the fruiting body. So let's look at this over here. Um, these, all of, like each branch over here is called a hyphae. And as you can see, it actually comes all the way up to the fruiting body, makes the fruiting body as well. And when you have this collection, this network down here under the soil, this is called the mycelium. And this is the fruiting body. So the fruiting body is going to be formed from dense bunches of the hyphae, as you can see here. The top portion of the mushroom is called the cap. So here is the cap, and this is going to be, um, and actually if you turn it upside down, 
you're going to see gills. So these are the gills over here. It's a cap and then the gills. And the gills are the site of spore production. So if you take these gills and look at them under the microscope, you're going to find these tiny organs called the basidium. And the basidium is going to contain the spores. You're going to have the stalk right here. You can see the stalk, of course, that's going to hold the cap. And then you're going to see the annulus or the ring membrane. And this is going to be found around the stock right here. So this is um, the annulus is where the cap was attached to the stock before it opened. You're probably going to have a prepared slide to look at in lab. It's going to be like a piece of the gills. And if you magnify it and look at it you should be able to find the basidium and you're going to find the little spores on them or the basidiospore same thing a spore right here and this is what allows um, reproduction the spores allow reproduction of fungi to take place now in your lab manual there is the rhizopus life cycle so i'm gonna go over it and we're going to talk about sexual reproduction as well as asexual reproduction. So rhizopus, um, this is bread mold. This is black bread mold. And um, the black speckles, whenever you see them on your bread, those are actually capsules called sporangia. And sporangia are going to be produced through sexual reproduction. Again, the fungus, fungus is going to consist of a network of filaments called hyphae, and the hyphae are going to absorb nutrients. So if we look at it over here, you can see these areas right here. These are going to be made out of hyphae, of course. And then on the very top over here, you see spor um, sporangia. And within this sporangia, you're going to have lots of spores. And this is what allows asexual reproduction to take place. When the sporangia break open, the spores are going to disperse and they're going to fall on different things. And um, if they, let's say they fall on another piece of bread, the spores are going to grow and that's going to allow more fungi to grow on other um, food items. So that's how mold spreads. So when the spore um, travels by air to other locations, it is going to land on other food items. And if it received the, receives the nutrients that it needs, it's going to start to germinate. So here's a spore. Let's say it falls on another piece of bread. It's going to get the nutrients that it needs and it's going to start to elongate. And as it elongates, it's going to form the structure called the hyphae over here. And the hyphae is going to absorb nutrients. Um, now, as it develops, as this hyphae develops, um, it is going to produce another sporangia. And that sporangia, again, can burst open and the Spores can disperse again, and this cycle of asexual reproduction can take place. Now, with this particular fungi, you can also have sexual reproduction. There is no male or female. However, there are distinct mating types, and they are um, identified by these plus and minus signs. So, um, Sexual reproduction takes place when the adjacent hyphae of two types release pheromones. So let's say we have the hyphae right here with the minus sign, and then we have the hyphae right here with the plus sign. And let's say they produce, they, they're close enough, they're adjacent, and they start to release pheromones this. And as they release pheromones, they're going to start growing these side branches like this. And of 
course, there's going to be nuclei right here. And you're going to have some of the nuclei come move into these side branches over here. And then they're just going to get isolated and form the structure over here. And this structure is called the gametangia. What's going to happen is that in these gametangia, the nuclei are going to pair up and they're going to fuse and they're going to form this structure called the zygosporangium, as you could see over here. So the two different nuclei have fused. Remember, each one was haploid, but now that they have joined together, their nuclei have joined, now they have formed a structure here that's going to be diploid. And it's going to go through the process of meiosis. And it can stay dormant for a while. The structure can stay dormant for a while. And then after a while, it can germinate. So you could have another sporangium growing from it like this and then once the um, spores are released it can give rise to other fungi through asexual reproduction. So this what happened here, this was sexual reproduction, and this part would be like asexual reproduction, because this is giving rise to genetic variety. You have the nuclei fusing, um, forming this diploid structure. Um, so again, um, it could, this particular fungi can grow both through asexual reproduction and also through sexual reproduction. And again, this is just a little diagram I found online. In your lab manual, you had um, several divisions of fungi, and I think there's many different ways to divide them, but there was three primary ways, and I believe it is important for you guys to learn this before your lab quiz and for your lab exam. First one was Mastigo mycota. These are going to be fungi that produce flagellated spore spores. They're going to contain cellulose in their cell walls. Most of them are aquatic and many of them are saprophytes, but some are parasitic. Um, some examples will include like water molds and um, chytrids. So I believe this is a water mold over here. Next, um, next group are the amastigomycota or amastigomycota. These are going to be fungi that produce non motile spores. They have chitin in their cell walls. Some examples would be like common mold, yeasts, and mushrooms. So these are yeast and this is mushroom. I mean, yeast and these are common molds. Um, next, you have the deuteromycota. These are terrestrial and they include the sac and bulb fungi. And sometimes they are also called imperfect fungi. I am not sure if they're all parasitic, but I believe many are parasitic and pathogenic fungi. And please make sure to include your drawings in your lab reports. And feel free to use the internet to do a little bit of research for your lab report, but make sure you include um, sources that you've used for your lab report.